So sorry, just waiting that little cue. Okay, um, so I'm going to say again, welcome to everyone who's joining us today for our, this webinar, Common and Not So Common Birds in Our Backyards. Again, um, brought to you through the efforts and um, services of Washtenaw County Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, my name is Faye Stoner and I'm the presenter. And um, I worked as a naturalist for Washtenaw County Parks for almost 20 years. Um, I'm retired now, but the organization is um, kind enough to allow me to step into my old shoes sometimes and do some nature programming uh, still. So I'm really happy to be here and, and happy to be able to talk about one of my favorite things in nature to talk about birds. And some of you already met um, and heard Hannah Cooley. She's my partner this morning. Hannah is a management analyst, full-time person here at Washtenaw County Parks. And uh, I really appreciate she gave up part of her Saturday morning to, uh, to be of help to me. She's my technology person. So fingers crossed that all goes well. And um, I'm again, thankful for you folks for tuning in and, and giving up part of your morning too. So just briefly, um, my plan is to talk for roughly 15 minutes and we'll get a lot of photos of birds. I have some bird sounds, really my fingers are crossed for uh, the fact that they'll work well. And we'll talk about some bird natural history. I'll talk a little bit about resources that can help you uh, to see these common and not so common birds. So uh, dabbling into a, a bit of various things in this presentation. And I did wanna say um, my title, common and not so common birds in our backyards. Someone asked me if I'm talking only about birds that people might see literally looking out a window of their home. And the answer is, um, Kind of yes and no. Many birds that we'll see this morning can be seen in people's backyards, certainly. Um, but when I was thinking of the word backyard, I, I kind of meant uh, thinking about birds that just live on the same part of planet Earth that we live in. Um, so Washtenaw County and, and kind of the Southeast Michigan area. So um, a quick mention of the birds on the title slide. I'm, I'm actually not going to tell you or, or talk, tell you the name or talk about them right now. Um, we'll, we'll have a slide later, we'll, we'll cover these guys. Um, but I think they're so handsome, both of these birds. And um, one is incredibly common in our Washtenaw County area. And one is, I've even used the word rare, but we'll, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So, um, uh oh, already I'm having trouble. Uh, let's see. <laughs> and I can't seem to get it to click and move. I might need Hannah's assistance. Um, so when I use my camera. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank goodness again that Hannah's here. So I wanted to start with just a couple of photos of my favorite birds that um, can be seen in our area. And um, it's kind of hard sometimes doing a, a webinar where I can't talk to the people who are listening um, and have a sense of you know, where they might be in their enjoyment of birds, but but probably no matter where you are, if you've been birding a long time or just new to um, birding, or maybe you don't even bird, but you just like birds, I, I bet anyone on that uh, liking birds spectrum um, would recognize this as a woodpecker, and um, it is a woodpecker for sure, and this bird is, the name is pileated woodpecker, um, it's the largest woodpecker in Washtenaw County, the largest woodpecker in Michigan, and um, actually the largest woodpecker in North America, except if maybe there might still be a few ivory bills hiding in the big wetlands of um, the down south part of the United States. Um, some people say pileated when they say the name of this bird, and I intentionally looked this up a bit yesterday, and, and both pronunciations are accepted. I learned pileated long ago, and um, that's just the pronunciation that I uh, use for this bird. Um, big bird, as big as a crow, easy to recognize, strong black on the back, and that brilliant red that you see on the head coming to a point. Um, this feature is called a crest on bird. We'll talk about crests a little bit more later. Um, and as far as their presence in the county, I've lived in Michigan a little bit over 30 years now. I grew up in Pennsylvania. Um, in my first years of living in Washtenaw County, um, I never saw a pileated for, for years and years, and I won't say they weren't here because especially in those early days, I didn't bird um, as much as I did in the county, but, 
but definitely there are more pileated uh, in Washtenaw County now than there were 10 or 20 years ago. Um, I still wouldn't necessarily call them a common bird, but they're not rare, um, but a handsome bird, a bird that's thrilling to see um, no matter where or when you might see it. And um, just to look at another one of my favorite birds, um, this bird, when I was first learning to bird, it was called a sparrow hawk. Um, but it actually is not a hawk. It's um, in the falcon family. This is the American kestrel, and it's the smallest kestrel that we have in Michigan and in all of North America. I'm going to go back again um, now that you see that it is a pretty small bird just to let you see these images better. So uh, kestrels are birds that require lots of big open spaces for hunting. Um, there certainly can be trees. They use trees for perching. Sometimes they're perching on um, utility lines, but but you have to have a lot of big open space for kestrels to be um, found living there. So Washington County doesn't have quite as much big open field farm areas as it once did. Um, so this bird is, is not one of the most common birds, but, but again, I wouldn't call it a rare bird. Um, down Manchester Way, you can see them. Um, even um, more in the, the central part, maybe down Milan Way. And I live north of Dexter in Michigan, and, and we often see a kestrel now and then in our neighborhood. And I just wanted to mention quickly, um, this is an adult male, the picture on the left. And um, this picture on the right, um, I'm pretty sure it's an immature bird. Um, it'll get more adult plumage as it gets older. But I wanted to mention what this bird is doing. I, I don't know how well you could see me, but um, sometimes if you see a bird out in an open field, especially a smallish bird with its uh, wings puffing up and down quickly, um, it's hovering. That a, a, can be a key, that you're, a key ID trait that you're looking at a kestrel. Um, and it sometimes hovers like a helicopter would as it's looking across the ground for prey. Uh, being a small bird, it eats lots and lots of insects, but it can eat, um, things like mice and shrew and, and, um, and other smaller things like um, small snakes and, and such. But it, I just uh, love the handsomeness of this bird. So um, with that little introduction with just two of my favorite birds, we'll get a little more detailed um, thinking about birds and bird ID. So um, I, I guess I'll, I'll take a moment here just to say, we're gonna talk about uh, identifying birds, but I, I did wanna say, it's not necessary to know the name of a bird in order to appreciate how beautiful it is, beautiful in form or beautiful in song, or maybe to be amazed at some behavior a bird is doing. But when one um, does take the time to learn the name of a bird, it could be the same learning the name of anything, the name of a tree that you see that you've not noticed before, or the name of a person. Um, when we learn the names of things, it often deeps in, deepens a connection we have with them, our relationship with them. And um, sometimes in, in sociology, they say when we know more about something, we often, we can care about it more easily. So I think birds are a really important element um, in our natural world. So anything that helps us uh, care about birds more is, is a good thing um, in my mind. So, but, but again, people don't have to know the name of a bird in order to appreciate the wondrousness of it. But if you are someone who wants to identify birds looking out your window or hiking in your favorite park, there definitely are things you wanna pay attention to and look for. And the box that just popped up, the bullets are showing you things that you want to be able to try to notice um, as you're seeing an unknown bird. And with birds, the truth is they don't uh, sit still sometimes. So when you're um, being someone, uh, being a bird watcher or a birder, you have to know what to look for. And often you have to be quick about it before the bird leaves. So things like size of a bird, the coloring of a bird, the things um, that are known as field marks, like that crest we mentioned on the pileated woodpecker is a field mark. Um, we'll talk about these things with some of the other slides. The habitat that a bird is in, some birds are very fussy about their habitat, very particular, and other birds are more general. It can help um, sometimes knowing what a bird is eating, that might be a clue to ID. Behavior can be really helpful, like the hovering that we mentioned with that kestrel, um, that can, um, what a bird is doing can be a good ID clue. And the time of year, that's obviously not something you can see as you look at a bird, but the more you learn about birds, the more you become familiar with when they're present. So we'll talk about um, the various um, timings that birds have in this Washtenaw County area as we 
uh, talk about several birds today. And then I put this in its own little box um, to help you identify birds. A good thing to do um, is pay attention to the sound that birds make. Um, I'm a little bit past 60 now, and I probably started birding when I was about 12. And um, I certainly know many sounds, the songs and calls that birds make, but I realized there's a lot <laughs> that I don't know. And I uh, wish that long ago I had been more focused on learning bird sounds. So I think um, it's really a good thing if you're a brand new birder, um, definitely include that as part of your learning about birds, what sounds they make. And then if you're someone like me, um, been birding for a long time, but you're not real keen on the sound, it's, it's a good thing to go ahead and step into and practice. And um, what we're gonna do is hear a couple of sounds made by this bird that's on the screen. Um, probably lots of folks recognize this bird, um, but let me play first. A well, I'll play the song of this bird. Um, birds make various kinds of sounds. The song of a bird is typically what they make during mating season and typically just males sing the song, but not always. Um, and the, the purpose of a song is to define a territory, claim a territory and defend it and also to um, attract a mate. So here's the song of this bird. So this is a sound that you could definitely be hearing now. And long ago, someone told me in my naturalist working, you could think of it saying, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie. <laughs> um, so it, it's those three syllables there. So this is a sound you typically will hear the end of winter, throughout the spring, and even into early summer. But you won't hear the song of this bird in the months of October or November, September. Again, it has to do with the mating. But here's one of the calls of this bird. And it's actually part of its name. You're probably hearing dee dee dee. So that's just one of the um, non-song calls that this bird makes. And um, again, I bet most people have recognized the black-capped chickadee, a very common bird in our area, in lots of people's backyards, but found um, in all sorts of woods too. They don't definitely don't need to live near where people are living. So um, we're not gonna practice bird identification with every slide, but I, I wanna do that for a, a little bit with some of the slides that we're seeing. Uh, on the screen here. So with this idea of quickly noticing thing about birds, I want you first to be looking at this larger image, the one on the left, and pretend you see this bird and you only have three seconds. Even if you know what this bird is, you can practice this. Um, see what you observe, what you notice about it. And I would like to tell people there's no wrong observation when you're looking at things in nature, a flower or, or a bird. What you see is what you see. There's, there's nothing wrong that you can say about what you observe. Um, but sometimes we learn there are particular things to try to look for, to try to observe. But I'm gonna to toss some arrows into this slide. And um, if I saw this bird, these are some of the things that I would notice. I see, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, going along the back of the bird, I see that on the top of the bird, it's this soft grayish color. But then when I look at the throat and the belly and the, the chest area, it's, it's all um, more of a soft white color. Um, I see a little bit of red brown on the side of the bird. And then um, at the top is those, those pointy feathers, the field mark known as a crest. Again, we saw that with the pileated. So those are things that my eyes see that could definitely help me identify this bird. Again, um, you might see things that are different. You might have noticed um, something about the beak or um, this black color that you see above the beak. So again, there's not a wrong thing, but you try to notice as much as you can as quickly as you can. So let's do the same thing with this image here on the right. Um, pretend this bird is here in front of you for, for four seconds, so you have to look quickly. And so what do you notice? So here come my arrows, what I might notice. So in this bird, I notice it has a brown cap um, I'm noticing on the, the chest area, it's not just all one color like this bird. There's a central spot, um, a dark color there. Um, this is a little hard to notice if you're new to birding, but there's a stripe of white on the wing of this bird, as opposed to no stripe going across the wing of this bird. This is called a wing bar, and that's a field mark that can be helpful in identifying birds. 
And then my last arrow was pointing to the beak of this bird. If you look at the other bird, see the beak is the same color on the top and the bottom. But what you see on this bird, there's yellow on the bottom and a bit of grayish black on the top. So a bicolored beak. So this bicolored beak is definitely a field mark for this bird. And um, you probably recognize, I bet most of you did this bird, the tufted titmouse. And maybe many people also know the American tree sparrow. Both of these birds are commonly seen in the winter. Um, the, the chickadee and the titmouse, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, they're in our Washtenaw County area 12 months out of the year. We can see them um, all seasons, but this bird, the American tree sparrow, is um, more of a cold weather bird. Sometimes people say it's a winter bird, but actually the tree sparrow comes from its um, breeding areas up north, um, usually the end of September or early October, and it could stay through April. So it's not just um, this way in the winter time. And um, I'm gonna play the song of the titmouse in a minute, but I just wanted to make sure I, I noted, as we go through the slides, we're gonna be looking at and talking about birds that we can see in the winter time, and then we'll be moving through the seasons. So here's the song of a tufted titmouse. And I love hearing this song. I bet you've been hearing it um, around where you live. Definitely a sign of spring. So um, when you read about it, um, it's like it's saying the word Peter, 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 sometimes three times, sometimes four times, um, but a really heartening sound knowing that spring is coming. But I'll just mention titmice make a lot of sounds. Boy, as I'm practicing learning sounds of birds, many times I'm fooled by a titmouse thinking it's something more exotic and it ends up to be this bird that um, is a very common bird. So take a look at these two birds. Um, Again, just kind of generally looking at birds, noting how, uh, especially this bird's holding on to a side of a tree. Here's another woodpecker that lives in our area. Um, take that moment or two to observe, um, notice things about the bird. Um, I don't have any arrows for the wings, but it has this nice contrasting black and white. Um, these are the same species of birds, um, but there is a, one little difference that we'll get to in a minute. But um, my first arrow, I'm gonna to toss some arrows in, is pointing to something maybe you noticed and maybe not, but um, it's harder to see on this bird, but these birds have a little bit of orange red on their belly down low. And um, that contributes to the name of this bird. This is called a red-bellied woodpecker, very common bird um, throughout Washtenaw County, throughout Southeastern Michigan, found in um, neighborhoods in uh, various communities for sure, in Manchester and Dexter. Um, but out in the, the big woods, maybe of one of our rec areas. Um, it, it's hard to see that red bellied feature, but when one knows to try to look for it, especially I think in spring, you see it more easily. Um, it's something you can notice, but you don't need that red belly for, for identification because um, there's such striking features otherwise. Um, I'll send some arrows to the top of the head. Both of these birds um, have red on the back of the head, but a way to differentiate a male from a female. Um, note at the top of the head on the female, the red ends for a while, and you just have the gray feathers and then a little bit of red near the beak. But a male red belly woodpecker, the red goes from the back of the head up all the way to the beak. So um, just kind of fun sometimes to be able to tell, you know, the gender of the bird that you're looking at. And um, I'm just going to play one of the sounds of the, the red belly woodpecker that um, you might be hearing these ages. Great winter. So um, again, fun to be looking and listening for birds. So another woodpecker, we're certainly not gonna spend all our time on woodpecker, but there's a couple more. Um, this is one of our most common birds, again, in the Washtenaw County area. This bird, you can't tell from the slides, but it's smaller than the red-bellied woodpecker. Lots of people are familiar with this bird as well. Um, these are the two downy woodpeckers and um, being able to tell gender is pretty easy for these guys. The female has no red on the back of her head and male downy woodpeckers have um, a bit of red on the, on the very back side of their head. Um, again, you can find these in, in neighborhoods, in a city park or in um, you know, our more wild places, I'll say out away from um, our more urban areas. And this will be our, our last <laughs> woodpecker slide for a while. So um, sometimes it can be pretty tricky identifying birds. So the bird on the left is a downy that we've looked at before. The bird on the right is a hairy woodpecker. 
And um, these birds look very similar, um, but there is a definite difference in size. But unlike the slide that you're seeing here, usually you just see one bird and it can be kind of tough to be able to tell the difference. The downy woodpecker is very, very common, found in so many places, um, you know, definitely coming to um, suet and sunflowers in your backyard. Hairy woodpeckers are not rare, but they're not nearly as common as the downy. Um, so, so there's a good possibility to see them. Um, and sometimes it's hard to tell them apart. So there are some subtle ways looking at the tail and even with the red on the back of the head if there's a male, but a, a more, um, I don't know, easy to notice thing to differentiate the two. It's recommended that you look at the length of the beak of the woodpecker if you're trying to figure out downy or hairy and compare it to the length of the head from the back of the head to the front. And if the beak like here is um, a quarter or a third of the side of the length of the head, you know, it's definitely a smaller beak, um, it will be a downy. And then if you're looking at the beak and comparing the length of the beak to the length of the head, and if it's closer to half, you know, a little more, a little less, but closer to half, then you'll know that you're looking at a hairy woodpecker. But it can be really, really challenging. For all the years I've been birding, I sometimes get puzzled. And we're going to talk about eBird in a little bit. And um, on the checklist for eBird, there's a place for downy, there's a place for hairy, and they have a place where you can check off downy slash hairy, where, <laughs> where one is not sure. So, um, so sometimes, yeah, there's challenges in birding. So um, a few more birds for winter. Um, this bird sometimes in fact is called the snowbird. This is often in people's backyards, but again, it can be way out um, in preserves and parks far away from people. I don't really have arrows for this one, but nice gray that you see on the top of this bird, but a whitish um, belly there. This one is the male, this one is the female. She has again, coloration um, darker on the top and then with that whitish belly, but notice how she's more brown um, than the, the male is. Um, a pinkish beak that you see. This is a dark eyed junco and um, one more slide. So maybe you'll see a female junco and you're not sure, is that a sparrow? You know, what am I looking at? If you're able to see the outside tail feathers of the junco, maybe as she flies away, um, they're on the male and the female, then that could be a field mark to let you know for sure you are looking at a junco. And I put um, the subspecies of our junco, the slate colored subspecies. Um, juncos across North America can look different. Um, there's an Oregon junco. Um, and so we, um, you know, there could be juncos way in the West of the United States and juncos we have, and they're the, the same species, but they look um, different enough so that they've been put in a subspecies, but a very common bird. Um, but this, again, being called a snowbird, you could guess they're here in the winter, but again, they often come like the tree sparrow in, in late September or October, and they often stay till April. Um, but you know, we should be able to see jungles for quite a while still. And lots of people do see them if you feed the birds. So from a little bird the size of a sparrow to a large bird. Um, this is a bird people see often when they're driving along the highway. This is our most common bird of prey in the Washtenaw County area. If you're able to see the tail and if it's an adult, it's easy to identify yeah, the red-tailed hawk with that beautiful um, red tail um, all spread out there as it's flying. Um, but the red tail doesn't come to the bird until it's um, a year older or, or, or a bit older than that. So sometimes you'll see a hawk and you might not know because you can't see the red tail or sometimes when it's flying above you, you can't get a good look to see if the tail is red. But here's a field mark you can look for for red tail ID. These are called patagial bars. So if you're able to see the underside of the bird, look on the inside of the wing of the leading edge. And if you see um, darker coloration here than all um, other places along that leading edge, um, you'll know that you're looking at a red tail. Um, it's not always as dark as this. Sometimes the patagial bar can be lighter, but um, that's a, a, a good clue to use for, uh, for the red tail. And I'll really quickly play the red tail call. This time of year, um, they're starting to mate. And um, you can hear this call 12 months out of the year, but as they're um, establishing their territory and and forming up their, their mate relationship, you might hear that a bit more um, this springtime. So we'll talk about some waterfowl uh, in this presentation, birds that are seen in our Washtenaw County area. So before I click the name, um, just take a moment to do some observation of this bird. And I bet you would notice 
this bright eye that you see, you might call, say, oh, that's a yellow eye, but um, the, birders, um, the bird was given the name, the common golden eye. And um, there are some winters when you can see golden eyes quite often on the Huron. Um, so this is a bird that uh, we won't see in the summer, but, but it's a, a species that we could see um, in the winter months. So as far as identification goes, in this picture, you can see the iridescence of the green, but you don't always see that, that green so well, but you'll just see a dark head with that gold eye, but the spot of white between the eye and the beak is a good field mark for sure. And, um, and this is what the female likes. Not too long ago, you'll probably remember, it was so cold here in Washtenaw County and a lot of parts of the Huron River froze. And when that happens, waterfowl that are here spending the winter, they tend to get more congregated. So I am, um, saw several golden eyes in the last couple of weeks when it was so cold. But also this past winter, um, or this past December, I participated in the Christmas bird count and um, I had it part of the Huron River in my count area. And I, I, I would think I saw roughly 18 golden eye on the river and that was a week before uh, Christmas. So they can be here through many months of the winter. And then this bird, oh my gosh, such a handsome bird. I, I love this photo. Look at the beautifulness of those white wings that you see here. Um, this was a bird that was also on my Christmas bird count this year. And again, with the river being frozen um, a, a few weeks back, I would be driving the same stretch of the Huron um, several mornings in a row. And because again, there was less open water, um, every morning I saw um, these trumpeter swans in the same area of the, the Huron. Um, so it's, it's nice to be able to um, have a chance to see such a beautiful bird. So trumpeters are native swans. Um, real quick, I'll show you the, the photo of the non-native swan, the mute swan. If the birds are mature, it's easy to differentiate the black bill of the native trumpeter compared to the orange pink bill of the mute swan um, is a really good clue, especially again, if the birds are mature. Just quickly about the trumpeters um, at one time, in many, many years past, there were trumpeters all across North America, but it, it's a bird whose populations were greatly diminished. Um, the bird became extirpated in Michigan, which means they were totally gone from our state, but not gone from planet Earth. Um, but a reintroduction program was begun for Michigan in the late, late 1980s and um, early 1990s. And um, now happily in various parts of Michigan, there are, are hundreds of trumpeters again, um, including our Washtenaw County area. So uh, a very handsome bird, you know, once <laughs> not so long ago, not here at all. But um, I think on my Christmas bird count in my area, um, I counted 14 of these birds. Um, again, and that was in kind of getting to late December, um, but a wondrous bird to see. So I thought I would stop, uh, take a pause here just to see if there are any questions. Um, Hannah explained how questioning will go. So I'll just uh, see if Hannah wants to pop in with any questions at all. Yeah. Faye, I'm gonna just go over one more time for anybody who missed the intro. <clears throat> if you are on a computer and you hover on the bottom of your screen, you can see the raise hand feature or you can type a question in the Q and A um, uh, and we, we can answer that. So uh, please feel free to um, either type in a question, or if you'd like, you can also raise your hand, and I will I will ask you to unmute, and you can um, you can ask your question live. So we'll give you, um, Faye, how long you want a couple 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 minutes? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there are any questions up yet. Um, I'm going to pause another time in the presentation if people have questions, and we'll definitely save time at the end. And, uh, and I'll say too, maybe we can save at the end if you have anything you want to share. And maybe you had a, a really cool experience with a trumpeter swan um, yourself. Maybe we can um, share those towards the end of the presentation. So, so I'll go on, right, Hannah? Uh, Faye, there is a question from okay. Karen. Um, and it says, what is the bird on the slide? The bird that we're looking at right here? Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and continue then. Um, so I'm going to take away the question box there. And um, I'm sort of making a joke here. I, I wrote, this is a bird sign of spring, sort of. 
Um, definitely this is a photo from wintry time, but this is an American robin. And I've met a lot of people that in their mind when they see a robin in February or maybe even in January, they think, oh, spring is coming early. Um, I just like to share with folks um, when that might come up as a topic that um, robins actually can be found in Washtenaw County 12 months out of the year. It's true that there aren't as many in the winter, but we always have some robins stay. They often hang around the edges of the river or places where groundwater comes up through to look for food. Or also if there's plenty of fruit from last fall, they're able to uh, stay and do fine in the winter. And I had several robins on my um, Christmas bird count as well. So a very, very common bird, again, in people's backyards, certainly, but you can see robins um, out in forested areas or feeding in, in open areas of more wild places as well. And I put two more slides of robins here. I, I just like to share this with people because I birded for a long time and had no idea how to tell a male robin from a female. Um, so it's so great to learn that. But if you look at the arrow here, notice how the head is really dark on, this is the male. And then it changes, very easily noted the change of feather color to gray, that's a male. And then down here, there's not that definitive color change. So this is a female. So in the first Robin slide, I had um, black here and gray here. So this one is a male too. So um, again, sometimes it's just fun to know a little bit more about the bird than just uh, what its name is. So um, there we go. My sign of spring, as far as birds go, is this bird, the um, kind of almost a bird that <laughs> needs no intro. It's a black bird with red wings. Um, this is one of the most common birds in Washtenaw County um, from say February through November, but most of them leave for the winter. There's always some um, but very few that can stay, but, um, but most of them go. And um, they typically come back, oh, I'll say often around February 20th, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. Um, but these birds are back for sure. And I'm gonna play the sound of them. This also heralds spring uh, to my mind and my heart, definitely. So uh, a lovely, lovely sound for sure. So this is a male and males come back many weeks before the female. And so this is what a female red wing looks like. So she looks quite a bit different. She looks like a, a sparrow, um, but much bigger than, than our typical sparrows. Um, but we'll look for the females returning uh, sometime in April. And it's kind of interesting, both of these photos have cattails in them. So cattail marshes are a favorite habitat for these birds to nest in, but sometimes they're nesting up in dry land and open fields as well. And um, birds coming back, returning, um, these are some pictures I took just two days ago through the window of my house. Um, so this is a feeding area that I have. Um, and almost all of these are red-winged blackbirds, but there's a grackle there too. So notice this maple tree here. So uh, there were over 200 birds that landed in my yard at this particular time, but luckily they didn't stay long because um, they sure do eat a lot of food up quickly. Um, but these birds are coming back. So for a little bit, we'll talk about um, waterfowl and we're kind of shifting away from winter now and getting into spring. Um, in spring, the months of March and April are when a lot of waterfowl move through. This duck that you see here um, is a bufflehead. And um, I, again, it's so true. Nothing's real solid in information. If we say mostly we see buffleheads in migration, that's true. But people had buffleheads on the Christmas bird count this year as well. So, so things aren't always nicely, neatly wrapped up. Um, the birds don't think the same way that, that the humans do as we're thinking about them. Um, but definitely we'll see lots more buffleheads during the migration time. Um, doing the bird observation. Um, this bird has a, a darkish head. I'm gonna do the next picture. Uh, again, you have to have the perfect lighting to see these iridescent colors. So you'll mostly see dark typically when you're looking, but this bird has a patch of white on the back of the head, kind of opposite of the golden eye where that spot was between the eye and the beak. Um, so this is a, a little flock of bubble head on water. And then this is the female, um, not nearly as um, festive looking as the male. Um, but this is one of our smaller ducks. The size um, can help you with identification too, but putting size coloration 
um, and behavior together. Um, when you look at the ducks, there are two main groups of ducks. Buffleheads are diving ducks, so they'll um, literally go under the water and disappear for several seconds and then pop up again, going under the, under the water to look for food. Whereas um, this duck, which is a northern shoveler, this is what's called a puddle duck. And most puddle ducks, what they do is tip their head, put their head under the water and tip their butt up into the air, but rarely do they dive um, to look for food. Although um, a couple of times I've seen mallards, which are basically puddle ducks, um, literally diving under the water. So like I just mentioned, um, you know, birds didn't do the, what they need to do. Um, so it doesn't always follow what our, our identification books or um, science books say. So the Northern Shoveler, sometimes people do mix them up for mallards. This looks quite a bit like a female mallard coloration wise, but when you can take a look at that beak, I couldn't find a picture that showed you well how wide the beak is, but the shoveler name comes from how, how wide and a little bit extra long their beak is. Um, people might see that green head and think mallard, but the body of this bird um, is quite different than um, than a mallard. And, and this is a, one of our bigger ducks that migrate through. And then um, loons, so a special bird to a lot of people. And um, if you spend a lot of time up north in Michigan or other places up north, you would get to see these birds um, all summer long in their breeding range. But we typically just see them at migration time. And you need to visit big bodies of water in order to see a loon. So like the Huron River, um, in the part known as Barton Pond, it's um, upriver from Barton Dam or a place like Independence Lake or Whitmore Lake um, or Watkins Lake at uh, one of our newer preserves in the county. Um, the birds are migrating through and spending a, a, a little bit of resting time on our waters to keep going north. I used to spend a lot of time at Independence Lake and um, just a couple of occasions, um, here I am in you know, Washtenaw County down south of Michigan, and, but I heard this. So we don't get to hear loons too often here down south, but it is possible in my picture time. So wondrous sound. So um, some of the birds that we might see lots of in migration time aren't necessarily continuing to go north. Um, it, wood ducks are, are ducks that most of them leave for the winter, but you can see wood ducks in wintertime too, but we often see more of them as they're migrating through. But this is one um, that actually will nest here in Washtenaw County. Um, the male on the top, if you've never seen a wood duck, uh, they're I think both of them are very attractive, but the male a much more um, uh, you know, brilliant color pattern that you see there. Um, these ducks, wood ducks, they're cavity nesting birds, meaning that they have to have their nest in a hole in a tree somewhere. So this shows the female coming out. And then this slide shows her on the water with all her ducklings. And um, lots of people have seen this on, let's say, public television programs. Um, but how do the babies get out of this hole and down to the water? Well, they jump. Um, they just have to uh, rustle up the courage to step out of their, their nest hole and um, sometimes landing directly in water, depending on where the tree is or sometimes they're landing on the ground, but um, beautiful and interesting duck for sure. So um, we'll leave the waterfowl for a bit. And um, I wanted to show the picture of the American goldfinch, um, a bird that we have 12 months out of the year. And it's a very common bird, but the bird looks different um, from breeding time to winter time. So this is a picture of a winter um, goldfinch, or at least definitely the males are changing. And then this is what the birds will look like look like by um, the time May comes. So um, all birds go through a molt of one kind or another. And um, in order to change or go back from their winter plumage to their spring and breeding plumage, um, what goldfinches do is um, just molt their body feathers and get this bright yellow color. Um, I learned I learned a lot actually getting ready for this presentation. And one thing I learned is that um, the goldfinches, I put this here just to help me make sure that I get it right. The goldfinches molt all of their feathers in September and turn into that less colorful um, plumage. And then as um, spring is approaching, they do a partial molt and they get the new body feathers like we mentioned. 
Um, but the wing feathers and the tail feathers um, are not molted. So they're gonna be the oldest feathers on the goldfinch. And I learned this um, a couple of places lately, but when feathers are black, they're stronger than feathers that are white or kind of a buff color here. And often for goldfinches, by the time um, we see them in August or early September, um, sometimes their wings are solid white, or as you can see in this photo, a lot less white is present um, comparing the two birds. And what I learned was um, white feathers just aren't as strong as, as darker feathers. And so as the bird is brushing up against plants or maybe against other birds, abrasion happens. And sometimes uh, a lot of this white is um, just rubbed away um, by the time it's time to molt and get new feathers. So um, just so many interesting things <laughs> that happen in nature. So um, yeah, as spring is coming, um, lots of migration starts to happen. So we'll just look at a few species of birds that we see sometimes just for a few weeks. And um, two of my favorite, the white crown sparrow. Um, if you feed the birds, you sometimes get to a good look at white crown sparrows, but, but um, sometimes you just see them in, in lawns, you know, where there's no feeder at all. And this uh, is one of our many warblers that passed through in migration, a black burning warbler. Uh, my friend Ron calls this a fire bird or fire throat, um, but two of my favorite birds to see in migration. And then just a few more. Um, if you're new to birding, um, gosh, there are so many birds that can, um, you know, come into your eye or the view of your binoculars at migration time. Um, so a chestnut sided warbler and a winter wren, um, and then a rusty blackbird and a black throat of blue. So it's very common to see the warblers, um, typically late April and early May, we're looking for them. Um, winter wrens are actually migrating through now. Um, maybe not quite as common as many of the warblers are. And then rusty blackbirds will be coming through um, in a spring migration and a fall. But um, yeah, folks who are, are into birding, you know, this time of year, we begin to get really excited knowing so many different birds are coming our way soon. And um, this was another place, Hannah, where I had a, a pause for questions, if there were for any other questions. Uh, so again, if, if anyone wants to hover on the bottom of their screen, raise their hand, or um, if you wanted to ask some questions in the chat, we can read those and get those answered for you. Um, and so, oh, hang on, we have a hand raised. Okay. I'm gonna allow, uh, Stefan, I'm gonna allow you to talk now. So you may go ahead and unmute yourself now. Hi, Faye. Hi, Stefan. <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, the bird sounds are so clear and seemingly so near. How are, were those collected? Boy, um, there are certain scientists that that's their expertise and their focus to go out and record bird sounds. Um, oh, right now, I can't, the gentleman's name can't, I can't bring him to mind, but, but there are people that are um, famous for, for all the bird recordings they have made. But, but nowadays, technology is so amazing. Like people like you and I can even, um, you know, sometimes using our phone if the bird is close enough um, we can record it. And then again, we're going to talk about eBird in a minute. And then things like photos and recordings can be sent to eBird. But I would say um, scientists who are focusing on bird sound, they have pretty fancy, more highly um, uh, advanced technology for bird recordings. But it, it's pretty amazing. Um, so they use devices to gather in the sound sometimes. And um, to be honest, I don't, I don't know any great detail. I just know there's really great equipment that one could purchase. So I'm glad to, and it's nice to have that feedback that you're hearing the sound well, so so thanks. Yeah, and as I, as I mentioned, it, it's a whole realm of birding that um, sometimes it, it, it is a little bit harder. Um, you know, it takes practice, you know, getting your ear working, but um, it, it's, it has a whole new dimension to birding when you include the sounds. So, um, well, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, but, but people who are, you know, just using good equipment and, and have that, you know, as their special focus is what gives us a lot of the recordings. Thanks, Stefan. Sure. And then any, Hannah, anything else that you see? Um, 
If there are no, there are no other hands raised now or questions okay. in the chat. So I think you can move on. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And again, there'll be time at the end if anyone does. So um, we're kind of moving now, getting closer to summer. Um, and on this slide are, are photos of four birds um, that we see only in the summer months in Washtenaw County. And all of these birds are, are fairly common to see um, in birds that typically leave by September, um, maybe October at the latest. Actually, this is a swallow. They tend to leave even earlier. Um, but as April and May are approaching, again, for people who bird watch it, oh, it's just a, such a wondrous time in spring knowing that so many birds are returning. Um, so before I put the names up, you could just do your practice observation kind of quickly um, as you're looking, you know, what do you notice about this bird? It's blue, this bird is kind of bluish too, but what do you notice that's different? Um, look at these big long um, tail sections here, the big fork tail. Um, this bird is easy. Um, sometimes there's just one thing you need to see on a bird to identify it. So this black head and the red bib we could say um, is something that gets our attention. This bird is, is bright yellow, but reddish streaks there on the chest. And um, so again, birding is about um, noticing things with our senses and, and, um, and getting to know uh, these little wondrous being. So indigo bunting is this bird, barn swallow, um, rose-breasted grosbeak, and yellow warbler. Um, probably of these four birds, this, this, this bird isn't rare, but it's probably of these um, four species, one that's a little less common that, than the others here. Um, but these are all um, birds that are relatively easy to find um, in Washington County, again, from say May to August or September. Um, so we're going to practice a little bird, bit of bird ID. So if you um, think back to winter birds, we talked about this bird already. Um, this is our American tree sparrow that's here from, say, October to April. But I'm going to show you another sparrow and look carefully at it. And I'm going to go back. So again, using your powers of observation, um, this bird, the tree sparrow is, a, I'll say a winter bird, and this bird um, is a chipping sparrow and it's here in the summer, but there are a, a handful of weeks, March and April, and then in fall migration as well, when chipping sparrows and tree sparrows could both be present. And so that's when, um, if you're trying to ID the bird species you're looking at, you have to be keen again and look quickly, oops. Um, Oh, oh, lost my arrows. There we go. So this bird has a brown cap like the tree sparrow does, but notice there's no dark spot on the chest. It's just on um, this soft grayish color, um, no markings at all on the chest. And then the beak is not bicolored. Um, so those are some ways to tell a chipping sparrow from a tree sparrow. But, but again, chipping sparrows are mostly a summer bird and tree sparrows more in the cool weather. And then we'll play the sound of the chipping sparrow. Um, this is this bird, this sound doesn't remind me of spring, but it reminds me of summer, warmer days. So these are often in people's um, homes, uh, singing from evergreen you, might, evergreen you might have planted or often um, singing from parks where, um, you know, there's open habitat, but trees nearby. Um, so chipping sparrows uh, to be here soon. Um, All right, and we're getting um, closer to, to our end here. I'm checking the time. Um, we'll look at a few more summer birds and then talk about some resources and then I'll finish up. Um, folks might recognize these birds as Orioles. Um, the top one is the Baltimore Oriole, male and female, male being brighter. And the lower one um, is the lesser common, but still uh, we're able to see this in Washington County, but Baltimore Orioles are more common than the Orchard Oriole. Um, but good to know that we can have both of them. So when you see a bird that has orange with a black head, you just have to, um, you know, just look a little more carefully. Um, there's more bright red in the wing of the Baltimore and he's a, a brighter orange than, than what you see on the Orchard Oriole. Um, this bird, I love teaching about this bird. So a stunning bird um, in his breeding plumage. So we had the red-winged blackbird 
Um, this is a black winged red bird. Um, this is the scarlet tanager. And we talked about molting a little bit with the goldfinch. This is the breeding plumage for the scarlet tanager. And this is what he looks like when he arrives um, back in Michigan from his wintering grounds way south. I meant to look up where they uh, winter, but um, it might be as far away as South America. But I, I know they travel a good distance. But when breeding is done, um, raising the young is done, um, what happens is he goes through a molt and you can see a lot of the red is disappearing and changing to yellow. And then by the time the molt is done, and when this bird is flying back to its wintering grounds far south, he doesn't look anything like he did when he came. So he goes through a, a, a pretty um, dramatic molt changing from that bright red to a kind of a bluish green, or excuse me, a greenish yellow. And then here's the female. She um, isn't nearly as bright as the male. And then I want to play the song of the Scarlet Tanager. Makes me think of summer for sure. And um, some people say think of think of a robin with a sore throat. That's his song. And, and it's really good to learn this song. Um, scarlet tanagers often are, even though they're bright red, they're hard to see because they're often up in the canopy of the forest where they're nesting. Um, and then this is a call of the um, scarlet tanager. So a good one to know also. They say chick burr, chick burr. Um, so, so again, um, good to kind of recognize um, sounds when we can. So this was the title slide. Um, so we're finally getting to it. Um, I bet almost everyone recognizes this bird up here. This is um, our Northern Cardinal, very common in Washtenaw County and here all year long. And this bird, um, I think I read the only all red bird that we have in North America. Um, you can see the cardinal has black around his beak. Um, this is a summer tanager and um, they are rare in Washtenaw County. Um, this might be the only bird that I use the word rare for, um, but sometimes people are seeing an adult male, but sometimes they are seeing a female or maybe even an immature. Um, but just good to know that sometimes we have um, rare birds coming through. Um, I'm gonna show you something from eBird in a minute about these, but um, you know, the flashing red, um, just, you know, sometimes in your brain, you can go, oh, Cardinal or Scarlet Tanager, or maybe a Summer Tanager. So, so, you know, a challenge for us to be looking carefully and paying attention. So some resources we can use to help with birding. Um, I have all this information on this slide, but. I, I thought all I should have said was just remember the word eBird um, you see down here. You could copy this link if you wanted, but if you just Google eBird, it will take you to a website where you can um, get all kinds of information about birds. You do need an account, but the account is free. But eBird is a wealth of knowledge. You can It's a way where you can keep track of your own bird list. You can look at maps and find places to go birding. You can look up a bird species and know if there's somewhere close where you can find it. And that's what I was talking about here. If you're looking at eBird, click on Explore, and that will take you to, um, you have to get to your region. Um, so it, actually, if you type in Washtenaw, it takes you to Washtenaw, Michigan, US. But you can see places called hotspots that are great places for birding. And then you can learn about a lot of these species that we've been talking about. So here's a page, uh, just a sample of something you can see on eBird. I mean, really, there is so much info. You could, you could glean so many bits of info about birds by looking at eBird. But you can um, get to Washtenaw County and it'll give you a list of all the birds that have been seen. And then what this bar graph shows you down here, it says skinny green is rare. And then when it gets wider, it's widespread. So here's the Northern Cardinal. And I hope you can see my cursor, but it's here 12 months out of the year. And it's a really common bird. And then just um, uh, not so far above it is Summer Tanager, that bird that's all red. Um, look how thin the line is. And it's only, there's green only in the, um, the summery months of the year. Um, so really, it, it, it's just amazing. Here's that indigo bunting that we mentioned. So certain months of the year, it is fairly common, um, but it can give you an idea of when the birds come and when they go. Um, and again, just, just kind of exploring um, the website eBird can be so amazing. Here's an example of a map from eBird. Um, I chose to use Dexter here in Metro Park. I was thinking, oh, just pretend you live in Dexter and you wanna find some good places to go birding. Um, this is Dexter here and here. 
Um, this is Vern Stokes, which is, which is a Washtenaw County Preserve. This is Delhi Metro Park here, but you can click on each of these and it gives you information, how many species, and you can look at checklists and all. So, um, you know, just again, eBird is amazing, all the info. And you can submit your own checklist to eBird and, and you're functioning as a citizen scientist by um, sharing um, your, your birding list. So, um, you know, it's, it's good in so many ways for sure. Um, a few, I just listed a few really good places to go birding, Trinkley Marsh Preserve. I was there last night and um, saw geese and cranes and lots of red wings. Um, some red wings even established their territory. Independence Lake and Rolling Hills are, are parks in Washtenaw County, um, the Parks and Rec Organization, Westlake Preserve out in Dexter Township, Barton Pond and Dolphur, Coulter to Ann Arbor. And a really good place for birding is the Watkins Lake Preserve. and. Um, it connects to Watkins Lake State Park, which is way in the southwest corner of our county um, in Manchester Township. But there's so many more places. We're really lucky, good birding in our area. And um, besides eBird, this is a resource that you could um, purchase. It's not an ID book, but Birds of Washtenaw County, Michigan. This is a book that tells you good places to go for birding, tells you information about when birds come and go and where you might be able to find them. The book um, was um, copyrighted is 1992. So some of the info is changing as bird populations change, but it's a really good resource to find. You might have to like Google on used books and try to find it, but it's a great book to have for sure. Um, a good place for, to learn about birding is Washtenaw Audubon Society. And um, if you just Google that or um, WashtenawAudubon.org, um, you can join their, their educational programs. Lots of good birders in our area, and they're always happy, happy to help new birders. And then um, speaking of learning to bird, here in, in Washtenaw County Parks, um, one of the naturalists, Kelsey Deering, um, a few Saturdays from now, Saturday, March 27th, she's doing a program on birding basics, where I'm sure she'll talk about at least a few of the things that we did today. Um, so you need to email Kelsey, um, and her email is below there. So if, um, if you don't have time to write that down, um, you can ask us at the end, and Hannah or I will give you Kelsey's email again. And um, I kind of am winding up now, but um, I put this slide in. Just as you're watching birds you know, in your backyard, if you're lucky and have bigger property, I encourage you to think about things you could do to um, provide for the birds, things that they need that help them survive um, as we're thinking of caring about birds. So you can uh, plant plants that you know birds can use. And I'll put a plug in for using native plants because that's what our birds are used to using. So um, our only hummingbird typically um, here in Michigan and a pretty common bird is the ruby-throated hummingbird, um, male here, female here. Um, and this is cardinal flower and jewelry, two native plants that um, are good for nectaring. And I wanted to mention quickly, um, occasionally we have the odd hummingbird and I um, intentionally looked this up. This is a rufous hummingbird. Um, most locations east of the Mississippi only have the ruby-throated hummingbird. If you go west of the Mississippi, there's all kinds of hummingbirds um, in the Western US, but um, of all those other species, this rufous one is the one that um, it's, I would I would call it, I don't know if I would call it rare, but very, very uncommon. But of all those other species in um, the United States, this is the one, the rufous, that um, tends to show up um, more often than any others. And just a slide showing um, all sorts of things. Um, this is pokeweed, that this is a, a young bluebird eating. Um, I'm pretty sure these are dogwood berries and a cedar wax wing eating. And I don't know, maybe if you have a really wild place, but these are um, poison ivy berries and this little bird is a kinglet. Um, but when we can have places for birds to um, have food, it's incredibly beneficial for them. Um, this is a slide showing three different species eating the fruit of the sumac staghorn or smooth. And I put the, um, the box up here. Um, if we get another snow, and I bet we will, you know, sometime now in, in March or early April, it can be really hard for birds to find um, food and be able to survive um, a couple inches of snow. So this is not a favorite of birds, the sumac fruit. Um, otherwise it would have been gone long ago, but it can really help them get through some hard times. So if you have sumac on your property, um, yeah, let it be for the birds. And then um, anything you can do to help promote insect presence. Um, Almost all birds feed their babies insects. So, you know, putting up a house like here for the bluebird, um, planting a garden that will help insects have a place for shelter. 
um, you know, just having a wild place in your garden or in your yard if you can. Um, but just I like when humans think about other beings on the earth in ways that we can be helpful to them. And then um, a really great thing to do for birds is to provide them with water. So this is kind of a fancy bird bath, but look what this person did. They just took kind of the base of a planter and put some attractive rocks in it and filled in the water. Actually, birds don't like very deep water, so keep that in mind. But you would be amazed at the birds that will come to a little um, platter of water. Um, so to finish with uh, just a few more of my favorite birds, um, Eastern bluebirds are one of my very favorite birds. Uh, not so long ago, there weren't um, many bluebirds to be seen. In my early days of living here in Washtenaw County, um, uh, I met many people then who were older than me saying, oh, I haven't seen a bluebird since I was a kid. But because I'll go back to this slide real quickly, um, bluebirds are cavity nesters like that wood duck we mentioned, but sometimes it's hard to find a cavity. But then there's there's been a strong program across the US, um, including in Michigan, of putting up bluebird nesting boxes and, and um, I'll have to go forward quickly. Um, but there are way more bluebirds now in Michigan than there were, say, 40, 50 years ago. But these are, this bird is one of my favorites. Oops, there we go. So cedar waxwings, um, one of my favorites for sure. Very handsome bird. Oh, there's the title. And then this arrow is pointing to um, the base of what are called secondary feathers. And um, I really did learn a lot doing this presentation. These are actually... Um, little appendages attached to the tip of the wings and, and they're, they're made up of a waxy material. And um, if the bird is younger, there won't be any red that you see on the wing. So these are both cedar wax wings, but this is a more mature one. And scientists aren't totally sure, but it seems like the older the bird is, the more waxy um, appendages they have. And they think that it's something that can be um, involved with, with finding a mate, attracting a mate. Um, but next summer, um, cedar waxwings nest kind of late in the year, but look for those young um, cedar waxwings in August or September and uh, notice how that they might not have any wax on their wing. Uh, this is the red-headed woodpecker. This is, of all the woodpeckers in, in our county, um, they can be here all year round. This is the, the least common of them all, but a stunning bird with an all red head and that contrasting black and white pattern. Um, so this is a bird that that's hard to see. I'm always really thrilled if I get a chance to see a red-headed woodpecker. One of my very favorite birds of open habitat. Um, this is an Eastern meadowlark. So very camouflaged on the top. It nests in um, grassy fields. Um, and if you're not sure it's a meadowlark, you can't see that stunning yellow with the black necklace. If you see it flying, and kind of like the jungle, if there's white outer tail feathers, um, but in the summer, and, and this bird's bigger than a jungle, but that's a clue that you're looking at a meadowlark. Um, again, one of my favorite birds. And my final bird um, is a wood thrush, um, a bird of forest habitat, um, a bird that is struggling, like, like um, actually several of the birds we've mentioned, um, not as many wood thrush at all um, in Michigan and other parts of the United States. There's there's actually now an international organization created to try to um, do research and do things that we can to um, help um, the wood thrush population get strong again. But I'm going to play. This is my last sound. Um, I love the sound of the wood thrush. They often sing more in the evening. That makes me feel like. Uh, I'm out for a nice summer stroll or, or maybe camping up north, but um, sometimes it can be hard to see. So again, I'm gonna play that one more time because it's such a beautiful sound. Oh, but a beautiful bird uh, song and uh, form as well. And with that, um, I want to say to everyone, you know, thank you so much for tuning in and joining our presentation again. Um, I appreciate that you gave your time this morning to um, learn a little bit about Washtenaw County birds. And, and really, we are so lucky. We have so many wonderful places um, in Washtenaw County and throughout South, Southeast Michigan for birding. So um, whether it's summer or winter, you know, take advantage of these wondrous creatures and um, 
you know, as you're doing your time in nature, you know, just give some eye and ear to them. So again, thanks so much for joining everyone. And, and then I'll let Hannah step in um, and just see if people have any questions. But, but again, thanks so much for joining. Faye, I, there is one question in the chat um, so far that says, um, could you talk a little bit about Cooper's hawks? They've seen uh, prey at feeders a couple times during deeper snow and in more extreme cold this winter. Um, and that's from Sherry. Okay, um, I think I heard the question. I wasn't sure, Hannah, but um, th this is actually a, a picture um, on this last slide of Cooper's hawks. They're um, not as common as red tails, but they're a, a fairly common hawk that we have um, in Washington County. Um, Cooper's hawks, more than the red tail, yes, feed on songbirds. And um, for some people, it's it's kind of a hard thing if you're someone who feeds the birds, puts out millet seed and, and sunflower seeds for um, some of the smaller songbirds to um, help them in the winter. Uh, sometimes cooper hawks uh, come in and um, they get their food from your feeder, but, but, but their food is um, snatching a bird that maybe was happily feeding. Um, they'll eat various kinds of birds, but morning doves are often um, a common prey of cooper's hawks. So it can be a hard thing about what I tell people. Um, cooper's hawks have to eat too. And, it just happens when we feed the birds, um, we're kind of sort of artificially congregating birds at that food source we're providing. And, um, um, you know, birds are trying to survive, um, all birds, and so they, they see it as an opportunity <laughs> coming to our feeding area. So I, I might have missed part of the question, um, Hannah, but did, it, did, I, did I cover that? Um, if not, can you tell me the part that I, I didn't quite catch? It was just a little bit about Cooper's hawks and how um, they've seen them at feeders a couple times this winter with the deeper snow and the, the extreme cold. Okay, right, yeah, and and that is true. Sometimes, um, yeah, when there's when it's uh, especially deeper snow, and it's not always the colder temperatures, but deeper snow makes it hard for all animals um, and all types of birds to find food. So, so again, they they figure out places that are to their greatest advantage for them finding food and. And, and you know sometimes literally surviving. So, um, yep. Not too long ago, I, I saw a flash outside my window and grabbed my binoculars and a Cooper's hawk. It was in a way kind of <laughs> dramatic, but it had snatched a dove and it was holding the dove pinned to the ground, but the dove was still alive at that moment. And um, but I knew it wouldn't be alive for much longer. But yeah, there's um, definitely like the drama of nature, but it's it's all about staying alive but yeah sometimes with our feeding areas we get to witness things we might not otherwise thanks faith and uh steve has another question um is it true that wood thrush has two voice boxes oh gosh um i have to say to be honest i don't know the answer to that um I'll tell you, I've, I've really come to learn this past winter. There, there's so much to learn about birds and I realize how much I don't know. So um, I just have to give that answer. But um, when I'm all done here, I'll, I'll definitely Google. I don't know if anybody who is still on um, knows the answer to that. If, um, if that bird has two voice boxes, um, yeah, please like type in the chat real quickly, but I don't know the answer, but I'll look it up later. <laughs> I else? don't have an answer, but it, but we can always include it um, when we share the presentation on our okay. social media and on the website and in our YouTube, um, which we we can we can add a note about that question. Okay, great. So I see I went over a bit. <laughs> so thanks for hanging in with me. The folks who are still here. Um, yeah, thanks so much for, for participating today and, and happy birding to whatever degree uh, that you enjoy looking at birds. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>